Praise. It's a new season. It's a new day. Pressing toward the goal. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 2015, pressing toward the mark. That's our word today, 2015, pressing toward the mark. I believe some of us needs a breakthrough in 2015. I believe there's some people here that really need a breakthrough. Actually, you needed it in 2014, but you sure enough needed it in 2015. We're going to believe God for the impossible. Is that right? I want to believe God. I want to stretch my faith beyond what I've ever stretched it before. Because I believe that the limitation is not God. The limitation sometimes is us. We believe, we say it, but do we really put our faith in action and believe that God can do the impossible? We see it in other people's lives, but will God do the same thing for us? God is no respecter of persons. That means what you see in somebody's life, whatever you see, if God allows you to witness it, God has allowed that to tease you but to please you. To let you know that if it's possible for somebody else, the same God will do the same thing for us. We've got to believe that. When, when God allows you to see the promised land, God allows someone else to have your blessing, stand up and rejoice. The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Because when God allows you to see it, it's a promise. It's a preview of what God has in store for you. Pressing toward the mark, looking at that scripture again, it says, not that I have already attained or already perfected, but I press on. You see that? Someone say press on. Press on. I press on. That means every day we're going to press. Every day you're going to set a mark, you're going to press every day. Uh, those that work out, and some of you have set some workout goals for this year already, right? Amen. You set some kind of a guideline, a benchmark on what you want to achieve during the year. And to do that, you set down daily goals, things you're going to do every day to help you move toward that goal. Now, to make that more relevant, say to yourself, I won't eat until I've accomplished my part of that goal for that day. Mm -hmm. mm, we like to eat, huh? So if we're going to exercise for 45 minutes a day, I won't eat until I've exercised for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. You see, it's got to cost us something. We give up so easily on things that does not cost us. It doesn't cost us to worship. So we don't choose to value things that we don't pay for. But when some things cost us something, we place value on that. When it costs us something to achieve something, suddenly it becomes more valuable to us. So during this year, if you don't achieve that goal, it should cost you something. It should cost you something. Don't be your own disappointment. Don't let 2015 be a repeat of 2014. You should, there's a blessing in 2015 for you. But to do that, you've got to have a new mindset for your new season. When we were in school, if you didn't pass classes, you had some options. You took summer school or you even repeated the class. Is that right? Yeah. I was looking at uh, the oldest graduate, continuous uh, grade school graduate, was 26 years old before he graduated high school. That's the limit. You cannot, in, in some states, in fact, in Texas and some, some districts, you can still attend high school up until you're 26 years old. You see, if you don't learn, you will burn. If you don't humble, you will crumble. Mm -hmm. Don't repeat 2014. 
You don't want to keep getting set back because you're not learning what you need to have learned in 2014. So you repeat it and you'll mess up again in 2015. You've got to learn the lesson. There's some people who are still stuck in 2008. We're still dealing with two issues from, that happened way back, long even before then. But you've got to learn, otherwise you'll keep repeating the same year again and again and again. Isn't it sad to see someone that's stuck, having, they're dealing with issues that they should have gotten over a long time ago? But rather than learn, from, learn the lesson, we keep repeating this situation again and again. And we keep stumbling and failing because we're not learning the lessons. There were some disappointments in 2014, but there were some valuable lessons in your disappointment. You may have had some hardship, but there was a lesson in your hardship. The setbacks were meant to teach you something. You may have gone through some financial issues in 2014, but there was a lesson. And if we will learn the lesson, we won't repeat it in 2015. But if we don't learn what we need to learn, we're continuing to repeat and repeat because we're not learning the lessons. There's a blessing in every situation. How do you see it? Do you see it as a stumbling block or a stepping stone? Is it an obstacle or an opportunity? I believe that we should see things as opportunities. Crisis is an opportunity to see Christ. Everything that we're at, every fork in the road, every intersection is meant to allow you options. And the first one is how we think about where we are. Because what we think about, we bring about. And we focus on the wrong thing. But this year, we're going to focus on what is good, what is true, what is right, what is pure, what is of good report. The Bible says in Philippians 4 and 8, think on these things. Amen. We have a choice what we think about. Yes. Yep. Right? Thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions becomes habits and habits become destiny. But it starts with what we think about. That's why the battlefield, the real battlefield is where? That's the battlefield. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the mindset that we got to have that's going to allow us to prosper and do God's will in 2015. Our mind has to be set on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Right? Walking and talking with my mind stayed on Jesus. Can't hate your neighbor with your mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 So every day we wake up and our mind is stayed on Jesus. And one way that I, that I do that is I park my mind on Jesus at night. If I'm parked on Jesus at night, I wake up on Jesus in the morning. You ever wake up and don't know where you are? I don't know where you park? Where's my car? When you have your mind parked on Jesus at night, you wake up on Jesus in the morning. Sometimes we can't sleep because we got so much stuff on our mind. Mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. Right? We got to have a new outlook in 2015. Make a note. Redefine yourself. Redefine yourself in 2015. Isaiah chapter number 11 and verse number 1. The outlook determines a lot about what you see. It's not what you see, it's your outlook. It means what you're looking out at, what you're looking out for, what you're looking out toward determines what you see. It's not what you see. It's your outlook that determines what you see. Two people can walk into a room and see completely different things based upon outlook. Not what's in the room. Outlook determines. So we're going to have a different outlook in 2015. We're not going to look at the same old bad things. We're going to look for the good in 2015. We can dwell on all kinds of things. We choose to have a positive outlook in 2015. Redefine yourself. In Isaiah chapter number 11 and verse number 1, 
It says his delight is in the fear of the Lord and he shall not judge by what? The sight of his eyes. We shall not judge by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Are you going to believe the truth or your lying eyes? Or your lying ears? Because you can hear what you want to hear, can't we? You can see what you want to see. Or you can see what God is trying to show you. And we miss what God's trying to show us because we're so busy occupied with what we see and what we don't like and what somebody said and what we heard. That's an option. We all have options in life. We can choose to see the positive or we can choose to see the negative. I found people that I at, they had a bad relationship out at the beginning and turned out to be close. You ever had that happen? It starts off on a bad foot, some, some bad footing. And somehow it turns out to be really good. But if you had based it only on what you saw, you may have missed the opportunity for the good. You see, sometimes beyond what you see is the blessing. When they went into the promised land, what they saw was their own outlook. They came back saying, but there's giants in the land. There's fortified cities and, and, and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. And they saw the wrong thing. But two came back with a report saying, it's a wonderful land. Let's go at once. Let's go now because God is able and we will possess this land because they saw the promise beyond the provision. You can see what you see or you can look beyond that and you can see the promise. You can see the blessing. But if you get tripped up by what you see, you'll miss the blessing. Something does not look like. It doesn't sound like. It doesn't feel like. It doesn't seem like. That's all senses. And when Satan gets you caught up in senses, it's about what you feel. He traps us with our senses. But beyond that is the level of faith that we should have. Let me have my prop, Kim. I want to show you a prop that I've got. I was impressed by this prop. This is... This is your brain on drugs. No. <laughs> this is an onion. And occasionally you buy something and you just sit on the counter for a while, right? And usually things will start to decay and you can get rid of it, you throw it out. This is a probably about a month old. And one thing that's interesting about this is it's a, called a lithophyte, a type of plant, a, a, a produce called a lithophyte. And a lithophyte once it's removed from the soil, it does not die. It continues to thrive. Because when it's removed from one environment, it gets its nourishment from another envir environment. You see, there are ways that you can be nurtured. Where you are is a, is a wonderful and comforting and nurturing place. But there may be a better environment for you that allow you to thrive beyond measure. And when God puts you in another place, God intends for you to thrive there. And you will thrive in areas that you may not even think that was possible for you. There's a blessing that God has been trying to put you into so that God can show himself mighty in the area that he's placing you. But you're so busy trying to stay where you are that you're missing what God is trying to do in your life. God wants you to be an abundant, overflowing. That when the world thinks that it's over, uh, you don't know, then suddenly God starts sprouting. And things start happening in you that you didn't even know were possible. Your best is still yet to come. Beyond what you could ever imagine, God says the impossible, exceeding and abundantly beyond. But it's according to the power that works in you, his power. This is not depending on anyone else to grow. I have not watered or done anything. It's the power within it that's producing what you see. There's power that's within each of us trying to produce Something. And the only limit is that we're not allowing God's power to be resurrected in us enough to really receive the fullness of what God wants. We don't want to get so into God sometimes because we miss, may miss what we've got. And God says what you are missing is the fullness of what I want you to receive. The fullness is not in us. The fullness is in him. I cannot produce it for myself. You can earn a living, a wage, paycheck to paycheck, get paid weekly, 
That's W-E-A-K-L-Y. <laughs> but God has that abundance. He says, press down, shake it together and overflowing. That's what he wants to do in our lives. That's what he's been trying to do every year. When you start your year off, you set your goals with all the things that you want to do, but I'm setting my goal, first of all, I'm parking it on Jesus. This year, this year, and I pressed last year, I really pressed hard last year. I achieved some goals last year, but this year, I, I want to be more like him. I got, I've got to do more, more, less of me, more of him. I want people to see more of him. When I walk into a room, I want people to say, wow, the lights got brighter in here because the presence of the Lord came with me. Amen. When you go somewhere, you, you should bless the place you go into. Yes. They should want you to come back to the restaurant because every time you come in, business picks up. Yeah. I go to my barber. I tell him, every time I come in, you know how many people come in after I come in? <laughs> yeah, tell him that. I said, you should give me free haircuts. Every time I come in, I pray five or six people come in. You didn't have anybody all day, but then I came in. <laughs> but that's just the favor of God the favor of God on the righteous the blessing of the Lord is on the righteous Proverbs chapter number it's in Proverbs <laughs> the blessing of the Lord is on the righteous and if you're in right standing with God you have blessing and favor that follows you everywhere you go so the first thing you want to do is redefine yourself in 2015 Guard your words carefully. And I want to share something from Joshua, chapter, chapter number 6. Guard your words very carefully. Joshua, chapter number 6, verses 2 through 4. What is happening, when they went into the promised land, as you know, the first time they went in, they sent spies in, and they came back with an evil report. And they missed the promised land because they saw the obstacle. They saw what they shouldn't have seen. They didn't see the faith. They didn't see the vision. They didn't see the possibilities. They missed the promises of God because they saw what they, their eyes allowed them to see. So Joshua 6 and 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do how often? Six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. So specific instructions. Priests, the ark, they're going to blow trumpets. You have the armor before, and then you have an advance behind. And you're going to march around the city one time every day. And then you're going to go back to your camp. Get up the next day, march around the city once. And you're going to do that every day for six days. But in the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times. Now, God could have done what he was going to do in the first day, couldn't he? See, God can do it. But a lot of times what God is trying to see, are you obedient to follow? To just follow the plan. If God gave you specific instructions, are you going to follow the instructions the way that God tells you to do it? Are you going to argue with God, argue with the pastor? Everything is something I talk about. People I don't believe that. I'm not going to do that. And God was speaking directly to you. I know sometimes I'm preaching right to you. I'm parked in front of you, right on your grill, on your roll. And you don't receive it because you're not allowing yourself to just follow what God has given you to do. What if he said, this? well, let's not march around six times. Let's just skip Wednesday because we, Wednesday we got other stuff to do. And those that can't go, we just go with a little remnant of people. God gave us specific instructions. And then he gave them another instruction. Here's, it was really critical in verse number, uh, number 10, Joshua 6 and 10. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth. Until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. There's value in learning how to be silent. When we come in here, Cassie talks about praising and giving God glory. We should be jumping and shouting in here like we've lost our mind. This is not the time to be quiet in here. The time to be quiet is out there when we should have been quiet. Right? 
There are times when we should have been quiet, we weren't quiet, and then we come in here and we want to be quiet before God. This is the time to shout before the Lord. And he said that when they began to shout, God began to move. The walls of Jericho came down when they began to shout. They began to give God praise. There were walls that's wanting to come down and waiting to come down, but it's waiting for you to shout and give God glory. Your walls won't come down until you learn that God deserves the highest praise. This is the time to praise him. This is the day to praise him. We've got something to shout about, but if we don't give God the praise, if we give praise to everything else, God says, I got a problem with that. Because your walls don't come down by you shouting for the world. Your walls come down when you start shouting and giving God the glory and giving God the praise. And I believe, I believe that we want some breakthroughs in 2015, but the breakthrough is in our praise. The first breakthrough is when we got to break through ourselves and believe that God really deserves praise. That's our first breakthrough. Is he really deserving of your praise? Oh, we've got it, but can we just let go and let God? Yes. Because God will do exceeding and abundantly, but the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people, yes. and we have to praise him for it. Yes. We beg him for it. We pray for it. But can we just put our hands out, and God, we're just going to praise you for this. I'm going to give you glory for it, because you're worthy of the praise. Now, that does not make sense if you're still stuck in your mind, if you're still stuck with a 2014 outlook. In 2015, you're going to get up and we're going to start praising God. We got something to praise God for. We're going to practice praise. Because sometimes it's not just flow. You just got to start with something. You may start with just standing up. If you never stood up, just start with just standing up. And soon just start waving your hand. Maybe not high, just got to raise it real low or something, you know. Keep it on the down low. Uh, stomp your feet, do something. But before you know it, the Bible says it starts inhabiting your praise. Yes. That means God starts coming in. If you give him a little bit, God starts giving back to you. And before you know it, praise and broke loose and you just start shouting and you're doing stuff that you didn't even know was you. People said, man, I didn't know you were like that. I, said, I didn't either. <laughs> God, God got hold of you and you just started, just, just let go and God took control. And maybe that's the issue. Maybe we don't want to give God that much control. Maybe, deep down, we don't want to give God what God really deserves. And God said, you can't give me what I deserve, and I can't give you what you deserve. What's holding us back is not God. God does not keep things from us. God keeps it for us. Everything that God has for you is for you. You could have claimed it a long time ago. But we'll keep repeating the same year, doing the same thing, hoping for a different result. If you didn't praise God in 2012, you didn't do it in 2013, didn't do it in 2014, something needs to change in your praise life. Something has to change. And that change has to be within. Things do not come to us. Things come from us. The good that comes in your life didn't come to you. It came from you. You sold for that good. You planted that good. Somehow you began to do it and that came back to you. When you start giving God glory and giving God praise, that praise comes back to you. When praises go up, I'm telling you, when you let God have it, God restores back to you the blessing. The favor of God is on you, but we release it through our praise. Somebody say amen. amen. Number three, let's, let's make a note to press daily. Press every day. Every day. The Bible shares in the first scripture, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I do not count myself to have apprehended, which means nobody's there yet. We're on our way there. And I don't know if I'll ever get there. But every day I'm going to be pressing my way toward there. That there is what God wants me to be. I'm pressing my way, the upward way, toward Jesus. I'm not there yet. I may be the pastor, but I'm not there. Some of you may be further along than I am, and I hope that you are. But I hope that we can find a way to encourage one another, and let's get there together. 
Let's struggle together. Let's strive together. Let's fall together. Let's get up together. Let's sing together. Let's pray together. Let's praise together. Let's take the narrow road together. It says, not that I have apprehended, but one thing I do. This is one thing we got to be careful to do. Forgetting. I will forgive, but I ain't never going to forget. Oh, you said it. We've said it like it's a proverb. <laughs> like it's something noteworthy. I'll forgive him. I'll never forget him. The completion of your forgiveness is not just forgetting, but restoration. When you forgive somebody, the Bible says, okay, now you go and restore them. Excuse me, God? Yeah, you restore them. You reconcile. Because to forgive and just hope that you never see them again is not forgiving. The one way to get rid of an enemy is to make them a friend. So it's not complete. It's not over just because you can say, I forgive them. Restoration. Because before God restored us, God forgave us. Every one of us has been forgiven. Nobody's perfect. Before God received us, God had to forgive us. That's why in your prayer, you say, Father, you confess your sins. You confess that you're a sinner. That's the first act of confession. Before you accept Jesus Christ, you confess your sins. And he forgives you your sins. And he begins to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we don't just forget. We got to forgive. We got to reconcile. This says forgetting those things which are where? Behind. Forget everything that's behind. Forget about it. 2014 is over. It's time to pick up a new outlook. Pick up 2015. Take the lemons from 2014 and make lemonade in 2015. Yeah. That's going to be good lemonade. Because some of us had a lot of lemons probably, right? <laughs> we can have a lemon sale. Take the lemons of 2014. Make 2015 better. Based upon 2014. 2014 was your preparation for the blessings of 2015. You've been prepared to receive in 2015. Let 2014 go. Learn the lessons. Pick up what God has for you in 2015. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching toward a reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. You're pressing toward that. I had a grandmother, I think my grandmother was 95 years old when God took her. And my grandmother, back in those days, they, didn't, they, they made people different. Like the cars are made differently, they made them to last. Yeah. Grandma, they used to fall out of trees and just get up and keep going. Had accidents, had cancer, cancer couldn't stop them. Rheumatoid arthritis, they took both feet, just cut the shoes out, just still kept going. Walker couldn't, couldn't hear well, but her mind was good. And even to 95 years old, they put her in the hospital, and she just wouldn't take the medicine that the doctor gave her. And the only way my grandmother died at 95 is they, they had her in these beds, and she fell out and broke her hip. And that's the one that took her out was that broken hip. My whole point is that they kept pressing. There was such a fervency about the Lord. If I, my grandma didn't leave a legacy of, 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 of that we think about, but she left a legacy of her love for Jesus. If there's one thing I can look back and knew that they loved the Lord with all of their heart and all of their understanding and everything was about the Lord. And I would see them praying and, and, and believing God and, and walking the word. It wasn't just like we have now where people can be superficial about it. You can look like a Christian. You can talk like a Christian and not be a Christian. You can learn all the protocol and still miss Jesus. I know they knew Jesus. And when you went down to church in places like that, and still I'm sure in Louisiana and some place like that, there's a little church. It's about the size of your living room. And it's packed. And they are just proclaiming Jesus. And they are looking 
and sounding and believing God as if their life depended on it. And we've got to believe God as if God really is our only source. Amen. See, back then they didn't have HMOs and insurance and they didn't have 401ks. They didn't have all the benefits that we have now. All they had was Jesus. And Jesus never disappointed. I didn't go to a doctor until I was, I think I was in the military. My mother, my grandmother, they, they knew, no matter what, they knew how to take care of us. And they didn't believe in every condition that came along. They proved cancer to be wrong. They proved every condition to try to take to be wrong. Because they believe that God is greater than every condition that could ever come along. And they're not going until God says we're going. I know the doctor gave me two years to live, but they outlived the doctors. Because they believe that God is greater. We've lost that faith. In 2015, we need to recommit ourselves to Jesus. We need to recommit and know that there's no other source except for Jesus. As I'm closing, let, let go of the past. That was my last point, let go of the past. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the righteous. Proverbs 13 and 22. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the righteous. If you're right with God, if you really are genuinely, sincerely sold out for Jesus Christ, the favor of God is going to magnify in your life. And when you really are all about him, you'll understand that the blessing is not for you. God produces fruit in your life so that others can benefit. What God is doing for you is not so you can store it up for you. God is allowing you to be fruit and a supply for the world. That the world may see him through you and through me. And the world needs to know Jesus Christ. And the only way that they're going to get to know him is someone who knows him. When I was in a, phys a physician, the most proud I was of people who came to, my, to me. I said, how did you hear about me? And they would say, one of your patients referred me. I was over here and somebody was talking about what you had done for them. Someone told me, I read somewhere, someone was sharing that you helped somebody who helped somebody. So they're coming to you. They don't know you, but they're coming, believing that what you did for them, you'll also do for me. And that's the same thing with Jesus. It's a referral source. When Jesus has been good to you and God is good in your life, all you're doing is telling people about it. With beggars telling other beggars where they can find bread just to nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody that's Jesus we need to have the world to know him let's proclaim Jesus in 2015 Father thank you thank you for allowing your word to go forth we pray that it has fallen on good soil